Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, thank you to Susanna and the team for inviting me to the party. Happy birthday. Uh, I, I might say I followed at least 19 of those 25 years quite closely. Uh, and I enjoyed it very much and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Um, well, disintermediation. Um, I, I sort of puzzled in the, in the beginning um, whether I would immediately buy the idea of there is a, a huge phenomenon of disintermediation and Jill has made it clear, I would have said it uh, also, uh, we are talking about a development but it's I think not a massive development uh, um, overtaking all the, all the uh, existing uh, business models and the entire value chain, but it's a relevant one and I think this is the very reason why uh, politicians and, and regulators devote time uh, to think through, to, to understand what is happening and, and this is the, the uh, value as such a thing that we can provide today uh, to give an idea and to provide, provide information about what we are talking actually you know, in this intermediation. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on this slide because these are examples of external, as I would call it, influences uh, in the value chain, in, in business models, uh, induced by technology in, in many instances. And Jill has touched upon these uh, as well, I think quite exhaustively. Um, I wanted to mention some of the more internal intermediation <coughs> phenomena that came to my mind when, when preparing uh, for the conference and the speech here. Uh, what is happening inside media, where you lose out middlemen that, that formerly played quite an important role. I think we should uh, also uh, bear that in mind and not forget about that. Automated journalism, for example, which is uh, mainly uh, algorithm-based, uh, artificial intelligence-based. Um, Jill already talked about a direct relation to the consumer and uh, direct knowledge of consumer preferences to uh, um, to learn what are the uh, expectations of con consumers towards the, the, uh, the product. One example, if you look into uh, when do people tend to zap, to switch from one channel to another, from one film to another, uh, it might come to your attention that if you do not have a sex scene, just as one example, in minute eight, you might lose 40% of the people watching until that step. Yeah, that could be one example for this. Uh, visual effects. Um, uh, yesterday, I learned uh, a little bit about the um, impact which visual effects have for filmmaking. Um, the middleman cut out could be the actor, for example, uh, because you only have to let's say, spend two days with the actor, uh, generate all the information from his face, from his body, how is he acting, how is he speaking, and then the rest you can do without the real actor, the physical actor, and do that uh, in a virtualized environment uh, by computers. Um, individualized programming um, is also something which is under threat, uh, as Jill pointed out, um, but this is also done within media uh, service providers um, and there you would question the, the relevance, the future relevance of uh, an editor, for example. Um, yeah, I learned a year ago about the um, movie trailer which was created by artificial intelligence um, simply from being um, educated by 80 to 100 other movie trailers and then developing from a movie uh, a, a trailer on its own, more or less. Yeah, and packages unbundling, I think this is also uh, something which, which was mentioned already. If you consider a package offered either by a cable TV, IPTV operator or by a pay TV operator uh, as something which, which is an intermediation that is also um, to be witnessed nowadays that um, those huge packages tend to be, let's say, not substituted but uh, accompanied by smaller offers, smaller products uh, within the market. So, um, if we take that serious, it would mean that um, 
some actors' uh, role is being mitigated heavily in some instances, or at least uh, seriously, or has even vanished. But my uh, point of view would be that we have new intermediaries in the value chain, um, and those intermediaries in part are active on each and every step or every link of the value chain nowadays, starting from production up until something which we uh, formally called a remote control, and which is now something which has a name, like Alexa or Siri, and who's not only taking commands, but who's also giving recommendations. So, uh, just to make it clear, I think the operating system in a traditional TV set was either not existent or non-relevant. I think today it is very relevant. Is it it? I don't know. I think I was invited not only to say what I already said, but to look a little bit further. What does it mean for regulation and for the kind of, of topics that traditionally audiovisual media policy, telecoms policy, copyright, uh, consumer protection, you can name it, uh, data protection, for example, uh, have to play here. Um, the, the four major points which I would like to present to you, I think uh, we have a loss of central authority to which regulation uh, formally attached obligations and rights. Um, that would traditionally have been a broadcaster, for example. There are intermediates, uh, aggregators, which claim they are not editorially responsible for what they are doing. Um, so you sort of lose that kind of concept and try to figure out something uh, as an addition to that or to invent something new. Um, when it comes to, to financing and, and um, um, the kind of return on investment that you are looking for, uh, you may also wonder um, if you lose a point of control over how content is being um, distributed, how it is being marketed, um, what does it mean for revenue streams, but also what does it mean for the entire sector. So revenue streams not only towards one or another actor, which was formerly important in the value chain, but for the entire sector. I think we um, have seen uh, instances where uh, the new world um, give gave rise to, to problems in, in terms of how does competition law um, apply to these new developments in the online platform sector. Um, so if you do not have a traditional relationship between a consumer and a provider of a service where the consumer pays in money or otherwise, um, but through allowing the use of his data um, does that mean that all the entire market concepts do not apply any longer, or do we have uh, something to, to add to the existing models? And the same you know, for, for consumer protection tools as well. Um, and overall, I think um, it is wise to start uh, opening the discussion, uh, not only today, uh, but today also because I think it was uh, scheduled for the European Commission to uh, uh, to publish its communication on online platforms today, so uh, it's absolutely tiny. Um, you, don't, you do not have to read all of that, I'm not going to tell all of that which is there. It's just on the left side um, what has changed or what, is, what has been relevant, and on the right side uh, what could be possible regulatory policy reactions to that kind of development that we are facing. Uh, to start with the first one, simply uh, in the old terms of analog broadcasting, there was a scarcity in resources, um, so it was not easy to become a broadcaster, and for all the producers, it was only a limited number of broadcasters with whom they could contract uh, to bring their content uh, to the public. That has gone, um, and, and now the question is, if it is so easy to enter the market, uh, do we still need those heavy, burdensome, 
time-consuming um, um, licensing procedures with media regulators, for example, or could we just say, okay, just give us a notice on, of who you are and where you are so that we can reach you once a problem pops up. So it's rather an ex post approach than an ex ante. Just one example in, in this area. As you can see, you can go along the lines and, and uh, see further examples. Uh, I already touched upon the second one. Uh, if there is no more a central authority for editorial responsibility, what could be bypasses or alternative ways of, of dealing with it? Okay. So I think we have disruption. That is another rough word, but I think it's still true. Something is changing heavily. Um, my feeling is that this also leads to re-intermediation or, if others might call it, full integration of the market. That would be the example which I already touched upon earlier. Uh, I'm not naming any specific company. Uh, I think everybody here is quite familiar uh, with the examples I'm thinking about in this, in this respect. So, what to do about it? Um, when, when being initially asked to, to give the keynote, um, the title was shorter than it is now in your programs. Uh, all of a sudden, there was a question of what kind of regulation do we attach to that? Thanks for that. Um, and the two, uh, so, sorry, the three buzzwords accompanied uh, uh, with that uh, title expansion were regulation, co regulation, self regulation. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not that simple. I think we have to think a little bit more in deep detail, a little bit deeper about what we are uh, um, probably doing about it. On the left side you can see a lot of questions that you should be asking yourselves before you start thinking about do we have to regulate. Yeah? Uh, it's about the public policy objectives that you might want to follow, it's about um, emphasis that you want to give to one, uh, uh, to one outcome for example, do you want to stress the importance of investment and innovation? Then that would be a guiding principle towards your approach when, when asking, do I have to regulate? Um, do you want to achieve a level playing field between all the actors? Similar service, similar rules, that would be a catch point in that regard. Um, do you want to rely on stakeholder governance and, and uh, refrain as much as possible from, from public uh, regulation? Uh, that could be the kind of question that you that you start with, um, and then it might turn out that you come to the conclusion for some of the issues there is no additional regulation needed, or I even could think of deregulating, liberalizing some things uh, because. Uh, you have more players on the market, choice is bigger for consumers, uh, the value for money might become better even, um, so that you uh, say, well, this is dead by, uh, by the market, uh, or you adapt regulation. But even if you think you have to regulate, um, on the right side now, you could ask yourself a couple of questions which are related to how do I regulate? Do I regulate in an ex ante or an ex post manner? Do I want to have horizontal regulation? Because if conversion is really something which attaches, uh, 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 which is relevant for so many players in so many instances, uh, and if, if the market is no longer sectoral, then you could opt for horizontal regulation. I think. Is it important to have technological neutrality and, and also future-proof regulation? Then you would perhaps say, well, I'm, I'm going to the basics, I'm, I'm adopting a more generalistic approach to, to the kind of regulation that I have. And finally, uh, do I think that my agencies, my authorities are, are apt and fit um, to sort of steer the markets to sort of uh, take care of each and every problem, then you would perhaps adopt it in an agency-driven approach. But if you say there's also room for private actors, consumers' enforcement, you could also foresee some of that uh, elements and instruments in your regulation. 
Um, minimum standards, full harmonization, these are also questions uh, up until uh, whether you choose for a directive or regulation. That is something which is really topical at the moment in, in the field of copyright, for example. So, please discuss and thanks a lot for the attention. <laughs>